Uh, thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here, and I'd like to thank the University of Johannesburg, uh, <coughs> Professor Swart, uh, Professor Rue, uh, Professor uh, Cora Burnett, and mostly to, to all of you uh, for coming along here today. Um, I will try to keep a balance uh, between the topics and be as objective as possible, but it's difficult at times, uh, even with the way, because of the nature of the topic with the, uh, the All Blacks at the core. Uh, so please, I didn't invent the All Blacks. Uh, I, I don't pay their salaries or anything like that, at least indirectly. Um, so um, forgive me in advance for the focus on, on things to do with New Zealand rugby, but I will also talk about uh, South Africa. So just a little bit about, uh, about me. Uh, I'm from uh, Dunedin, New Zealand, which is in the bottom uh, southeast coast, a town of 120,000. It is the Gaelic name for Edinburgh, Scotland, and it is a very Scottish town. And it highlights some of the implications of what we're talking about here, about the globalization of sport and how it can impact on a small community. 120,000 people and we're trying to operate a professional rugby franchise. That's a challenge. In, in Johannesburg, it might be a challenge. Try doing it in Dunedin with 120,000 people. This is a shot of our harbor and our uh, one castle uh, that we have left remain standing uh, with a little bit of the, uh, the British influence. And finally, this is uh, our clock tower, uh, one of the most photographed buildings uh, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, it's the oldest university in New Zealand, and while it likes to think it's Oxford or Cambridge, it's not quite that yet. Uh, we, will, we will keep trying. So here's uh, an overview of what I'm going to talk about today, and it is both a challenge and it's quite intimidating to come to South Africa and to come to Johannesburg and talk about rugby and to talk about the All Blacks and at times to talk about the Springboks all in the same conversation. So I'll just say that uh, up front. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how rugby has changed very briefly over the last 20 years, uh, keeping in mind that for some of you this is history, it may be a nostalgic and bring back some wonderful or horrible memories. Um, for many of the younger people, you may not even remember where professional rugby started. Uh, perhaps it's taught in your courses, but if not, hopefully this will provide a little bit of enlightenment. I'll then talk about a key moment, the rugby war in 1995. Uh, there was another kind of rugby event going on beyond the Rugby World Cup. And then I'll talk about the commercialization of the All Blacks uh, and this concept of corporate nationalism. I'll spend a little bit of time on the politics of the Hakka, but to be honest, that is an entire lecture in and of itself. I spend two hours giving a lecture to my students in, in a third or fourth year paper every year with good debates. And then I'll talk about the recent developments with a new sponsor. And time permitting, I'll talk a little bit about South Africa. So how has rugby changed over the last 20 years? Well, some of you may not remember that there was a Super 10 in 1993, but it was 1995 when the deal with Sanzar was formed, okay, that we had a rugby Super 12, and then it slowly expanded in 2006 and 2011, where we have 15 teams, okay, and the predictions are that by June, they will have announced a Super 18 which could incorporate Argentina, perhaps the Pacific Island team, perhaps Japan. How big does it need to get? Okay. So, what has happened? Here's a look at some of the franchises, things that we take for granted. And that's our job as sociologists, to take things that are common sense, that are taken for granted, and to put a spotlight on them and try to dig a little bit deeper about the processes that are shaping them. So for example, the simple fact that we have a team called the Lions or the Highlanders okay, is so common sense now, we don't really think about it. But that is a part of the global entertainment circus of sport that it has become, okay? the branding of sports. All right? And again, just a few snapshots, and you can see okay, the quick change okay, prior Okay, the, during the 70s, 80s, and now into the uh, 90s and today. The branding of stadia, where the games are played. The cheerleaders who are sponsored. Okay? The players themselves on the uniforms. The mascots who are also sponsored. The ambush marketing that is going on, where a company like Vodafone will pay a streaker to interrupt an All Black or any other test match. Okay? And one of the most recent developments, the University of Canberra, and now, Surprisingly, and a shock to most of us, 
the University of Otago sponsoring a rugby team? A big question, should taxpayer money be going into a professional rugby team? Okay, it's something, again, that's becoming common sense, but should we be doing it? And from a common sense point of view, do you want your um, taxpayer money and your university associated with a team that's only doing okay? And all the p potential for players to perhaps get on the wrong side of the law or in a, in a certain kind of scandal. What I don't have time to talk about today is if we look, for example, at the cheerleaders and we look at the signage on the uh, rugby field uh, where the players are in the All Black Spring Back test, Bach test, you can see a Castle Lager logo. We have beer, we have women, and we have sport. What we call the Holy Trinity. Men consuming all three. It's changing and now there's more and more women okay, consuming alcohol and consuming sport and consuming the bodies of men. That's a story for another time. Okay, let me focus for a moment on a specific example of Stadia and how they're changing. And many of you will remember Carisbrook, the house of pain as it was referred to. A stadium with a hundred year tradition okay, with lots of memories and I think that's where the Springboks played their first test outside of South Africa uh, when they re-entered after apartheid in 1994. A very exciting event. And now we have a replacement. The Forsyth Bar Stadium, the home of the Highlanders, a beautiful covered stadium, the only covered stadium in the Super 15. Okay, a wonderful thing when you deal with the, the weather of Dunedin where it rains a lot and the temperatures are quite cool. It's right on the university campus. It's fantastic, but it is costing us a lot of money. Taxpayers will be paying for this depreciating asset for a long, long time. It cannot help but lose m money, and there's many concerns that it will end up as a white elephant. Sound familiar from FIFA 2010 here in South Africa? What are those stadiums doing on a day-by-day -day basis? Okay, so what happened to Carisbrook? Well, Carisbrook will probably soon become a retirement home. They had a sale of the seats, torn down piece by piece, and now it's essentially rubble. It's moved on. Okay, that's progress, and it wasn't exactly the best of stadia, particularly if you had to go to the toilet, especially if you were a woman at halftime, um, but it had a lot of history and tradition, and in fact, there were people buried there. There were former players, their dying wish to, was to be buried there, and that became one of the debates uh, when they decided, started talking about building a new stadium for the 2011 Rugby World Cup. Okay, why did they build a new stadium? The International Rugby Board, prior to the Rugby World Cup, told the New Zealand Rugby Union, you must meet these standards, we need new stadia. The New Zealand Rugby Union said, if you want future tests, you must build a new stadium. And again, 120,000 people, that's a pretty small um, tax base. So far, so good. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about sport as a global commodity. And again, this requires us to think a little bit broader. What we have here, if we look down the left-hand side of the screen, we have some of the world's biggest international sport organizations. On the right-hand side, we have some of the biggest sporting leagues and competitions, and we can certainly uh, add to that the Premier League and perhaps the IPL cricket in India. And along the bottom, we have some of the world's biggest um, uh, mega sport events. In the middle, we have the biggest sports corporations, media sports corporations in the world, all of which have links with sport and they have links with sponsors and advertisers. Okay? It's an amazing mix. Okay? And you're, you've got a snapshot right there of the world's, okay, there's a few things missing, but the world's largest okay, entertainment sports complex okay, in existence, in the history of humankind. And the network is vast. Okay, you take one of those companies like News Corp, that's Rupert, Mur Rupert, Mur Rupert, Mur Rupert Murdoch's News Corp. He owns magazines, the internet, Forbes magazine, uh, movie production companies, sporting teams, and the list goes on and on. That is a lot of power and that is a lot of control. And I think the best example I can give to you regarding that power is from FIFA 2014 in Brazil. Okay, and many of you will be aware of this, but Anheuser-Busch, the American brewery, okay, with their number one brand, Budweiser, which has been a sponsor, I think, for the last 12 um, FIFA World Cups, lobbied FIFA to ensure that Brazil would change its laws and regulations to allow 
the promotion, advertising, and sale of alcohol, something that had been put into place okay, to protect citizens because of incidents that had happened before. An American beer company can force an international organization who, who can force in turn the laws and regulations of a country the size of Brazil. That is power. Sound like I'm giving a sermon. Sorry, I'm getting quite emotional about this. Okay, that is the sport media complex. Let's take a little look back. And this is, a, again, something that's a bit of a history lesson for some of you, um, but it'll be uh, news, perhaps, to a few of you. If you can remember back to 1995, you will uh, recall that a big event happened uh, right near here, I believe. Uh, um, I won't, I'm not even going to talk about, uh, it was an event that New Zealanders couldn't stomach. That's a really bad joke about the alleged food poisoning, which most of us don't believe. Okay, a momentous occasion that occurred. But at the same time as the Rugby World Cup was being played, within the same very few days, there was a rugby war going on. A rugby war going on between the World Rugby Corporation, backed by, in part, Kerry Packer, okay, an Australian media uh, mogul. He wasn't the only one involved but also Sanzar, okay? The South African, uh, Australian, New Zealand rugby unions. Okay, and this was happening right here, okay? At, um, right here in Johannesburg. A fight because the top players, many of the top players from the Tri-Nations had signed letters of intent to jump ship and to go play for the World Rugby Corporation. Why? Because there was a lot of money on the table. Okay, certain players got involved. Rupert Murdoch owned the rights, okay, to the next Rugby World Cup, but he didn't have any players. He didn't have anybody to play in the tournament. So he got his number one man, Sam Chisholm, who got his number one, number one man, Ian Frankberg, a South African who had lived in New Zealand, also in Australia, and then in the UK, working in the sport media uh, industry. And he's the one who essentially uh, brokered the deal. Okay, and Peter Fitzsimons book, if you haven't read it, is a, an excellent insight into the to and fro and just how close it came okay, to those players breaking away and who knows what world rugby would have looked like. Okay? There may not have been a Tri-Nations. There may not have been okay, a, a rugby championship. It may, there may not have been a, a, world, a rugby world cup in the same way that we know it today. It could have been much different. That was a turning point and as it notes there, August 27th, 1995, the IRB itself proclaims that amateur rugby was no more. Well, of course, amateur rugby had been probably dead for a long time, but this was, according to them, admitting that um, life had changed and the scenario had, uh, it was time to move on. Okay, so this was part of a, a global process, a global search for athletic talent to use in a global media spectacle. And people like Rupert Murdoch and Kerry Packer were out there, and in other sports it was happening as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what happened in New Zealand. New Zealand is often described, okay, as a case study, as, as the rugby nation. And I put a question mark there because, in my experience, I'm not sure it is. I think rugby has been, you know, enormously decentered since the 1981 Springbok Tour. But there are many other factors. There's just more things for people to do, more things for young kids to do these days. The access to the global media, they can be watching the NBA and have American stars or English Premier League uh, footballers or Indian cricket uh, players from the IPL. But these, the, the ad on the left is uh, an ad from the, the 1800s, which was used to recruit people from the UK. And you can see that although it was promoted as a land for settlers and the beautiful nature and the fishing and the farming, one of the key things was the home of the New Zealand footballers. And the argument was made that the New Zealand rugby nation predated the actual sovereign nation itself. The rugby clubs were so advanced and so organized and had an infrastructure almost beyond what the government at the time had. And that's one reason why rugby took off to such a great extent. Highlighting perhaps the mythical uh, sense that you know, everything in New Zealand is about rugby. You may recall this was one of the headlines after uh, one of the many Rugby World Cups that New Zealand lost. Um, and this one is uh, John Mitchell, who will probably be no uh, stranger to you. I think it's 2003. It's the end of the world. Well, it's 2014, and, and New, Zealand, New Zealand goes on, so it's not as if it is the end of the world. But another interesting one is this idea of loyalty. Uh, with uh, the Canterbury ad, and I know that Canterbury sponsors the uh, Springboks, which has always been quite odd to me that any other nation 
would accept a sponsorship from, from Canterbury. Because the equivalent would be that the All Blacks would wear a Springbok on their shirt. And I'm assuming you know what I'm talking about, but the CCC, there's a Kiwi bird in the CCC logo. Maybe you're aware of that, it's not just three C's, those are Kiwi birds, the New Zealand national bird is embedded in the actual logo. So you can see what I mean where I find it a little bit strange. But these days it's become common sense, whoever will give you the money um, gets, the, uh, um, gets the sponsorship. Keep the idea of loyal in mind later when we talk about the changing sponsorship in New Zealand. So what happened in 1995? Okay, well, as I mentioned, the rugby war uh, came to a head. Rupert Murdoch and News Corp won out. Sanzar was firmly established with some money behind them to um, have a Tri-Nations competition, okay, based on a 10-year, $550 million uh, deal. And that was small. It was big to rugby, but if you compared it to the NBA, uh, the National Hockey League, Major League Baseball, Premier League Soccer, uh, even college football teams, Okay, at this time, even prior to this, Notre Dame, a small Catholic university in Indiana, signed a $1 billion US TV deal for 10 years. Okay, so that's just to keep it in perspective. Only a short time later, Adidas Corporation, okay, a German slash European sportswear company, signed a five-year deal worth 75 to $100 million with the New Zealand Rugby Union. And my understanding through my inside sources that it was actually Nike had this deal signed up but a discussion at the Air New Zealand Lounge at the Auckland Airport changed things around with Louis Dreyfus asking the New Zealand Rugby Union representative, how much did Nike offer you? And said, we'll double it. And they got it just like that. So it shows you business is fickle sometimes. This was, I was told, it's hard for me to believe, the largest single team sport uh, contract that Adidas had ever signed. And that should make us think, why would you sign a sport like rugby, okay, given that it's, it wasn't as global of a game at the time, and why would you pick a team in a country with only 4.4 million consumers? Okay? Well, maybe some other things will, will answer that. Okay, four years later, Adidas signed an extended okay, $200 million nine-year deal. Okay? Six years later, they extended their contract to 2019. There are not many teams that sign such long-term contracts. What is it that's of cultural, symbolic, economic value about the All Blacks? Something I hope to try and highlight. Okay? And it might have been in part for the, last, uh, for the last sponsorship extension, they knew that Sansar was going to sign another deal, okay? which was US 437 million. And I, I'm not sure if that is quite accurate, but 3.24 uh, billion, billion rand. I'm, I just used the uh, global exchange uh, internet thing on that, so apologies if, I got that, if I've got that wrong. Okay, so what happened in New Zealand? How did a global company like Adidas come in to this small remote island okay, and take over one of the most cherished icons of the nation historically and even in contemporary times and get the sponsorship? How did they fit in and localize within the, the New Zealand context? Okay. So I'm gonna draw upon this concept corporate nationalism which uh, myself and other colleagues have used and I put it in as simple terms as I can. Corporate nationalism, you could argue in, on the one hand, it's how corporations show their loyalty and nationalistic uh, uh, sentiment towards uh, teams by providing them funding, but we look at it in a slightly different way. The process by which corporations use the currency or the value of the nation, whatever nation, that is its symbols, its images, stereotypes, collective identities, and memories as part of their overall branding strategy. And it's two very, very simple examples. I've taken examples from Coca-Cola, one, uh, one from FIFA 2010, and one for Coca-Cola where in New Zealand where they've taken the bottles and shaped it like a silver fern. Okay, I don't think it's particularly offensive. It's something that's quite common, but there are other examples which might lead us to question aspects of this process of corporate nationalism. Okay, so I'm going to try and trace okay, a little bit about how Adidas localized their brand within a New Zealand context. Okay. So the first thing that they did was 
put up money for a rugby academy. How do you get people on, in, a, in a local environment on your side? You give them money and say, we're going to help you set up the New Zealand Rugby Academy. And it was Dunedin and Palmerston North that fought it out, and unfortunately Dunedin did not win. Uh, but that's where the Adidas Institute of Rugby is at the current time. The next thing that Adidas did, which was quite controversial, more, more so than any uh, subsequent uh, jersey controversy, is that they offered a new jersey, and this was a big deal because Canterbury had been the sponsor for 75 years. 75 years. So they were up against a lot of opposition with this foreign German brand coming in here and messing with the All Blacks. Okay, and you can see the, uh, the white collared jersey there, and it's a little bit hard to make out, but the new jersey was a new material. It wasn't cotton. It didn't have a white collar. It had a Chinese collar and it was made out of a, a flexi material, the kind of the predate, predator to the ones you see today that are stretchy and they're hard to grab. Okay, very good for, um, for the performance of teams. Okay, so that's one way in which they tried to localize. Okay, another way of course is through their promotional, color, co um, promotional culture and that is the way that they advertised and marketed themselves. Okay, so I'm going to show you a few examples of television commercials that were launched in 1999 and two in particular Captains in Black, also known as the Hawk ad, and a couple of the print ads. And you'll notice a trend, okay, the colors that are used. So ask yourself why did they use these kinds of colors and why did they pick, pick some of these themes. Now some of these will seem a little bit foreign because you might not know all the main characters that are involved, uh, but um, I'll do my best to uh, explain them. So first the uh, Captain's ad, okay, released in 1999, okay, the first year that Adidas had taken over the sponsorship, and it draws upon a war song, okay, that was rewritten specifically for um, this, this ad. Let the war, let the Okay, so what you see there are the captains of the All Blacks over a number of generations. Okay, a very clever ad and you'll notice the first thing, it's all shot in black and white. It's shot in a locker room, okay, a very traditional, very nostalgic place. Okay, and it allows Adidas to embed itself in the entire history. It allows Adidas as a global corporation to appropriate the history, okay, of not only New Zealand rugby but of New Zealand itself. Is that okay? Again, it's become so common now. Okay, a very clever ad, I would argue, from a marketing standpoint. Okay, the song itself, you can see a sheet there on the, on the left-hand side. It was a black sheet handed out at rugby games, and the video was played there, and you could sing along. It's a war song which articulates sport, war, and masculinity. Okay, and if you listen to the lyrics, that is the sentiment that comes across. So it reinforces all the things that people thought of as New Zealand rugby, particularly in the notion of Anzac, okay, and some of, some of the great wars. Okay, a couple of posters, and there were many, I'm just giving you two examples here. Uh, the first one features Anton Oliver, who is actually uh, one of my students, and I can recall the day he came into my office, I didn't really know who he was, and said, could I give him the readings for the next uh, three weeks because he was going to be away, and I said, where are you going? He said, to South Africa. I said, well, what are you doing over there? He said, well, I'm playing rugby. Um, so it shows you uh, they don't necessarily all hold themselves up as celebrities uh, at times. Uh, but if you read the, the, uh, the words that are put up there, preserving your body never enters your mind. 
preserving your history never leaves it. Again, in black and white, okay, all about history and tradition. Okay, and the second one, okay, two all black captains from completely different generations. And in the background, it says in the stands, the legacy you face is more intimidating than any opposition. That is the fear of losing in New Zealand where you have this record of winning 70 to 80% of all your games is much more uh, intimidating than coming to play the Springboks. Uh, I think it's a great marketing thing. I don't think it's actually true, uh, but from a marketing standpoint, uh, quite clever. Again, in black and white and the use of nostalgia. Chris Laidlaw, a former All Black uh, and an ambassador to, uh, to South Africa at one time, uh, just retired from, a, from radio and journalism, made an observation at the time which sort of captures how a lot of people felt. And this is what he said, there is a real danger the control of the game in New Zealand will steadily be wrested away from New Zealand hands. It is the bottom line of the national personality that is at stake and we are in deep danger of letting Mick World have it for a few pieces of silver. The massive deals that have been done with major sponsors were the only way of preserving that sovereignty. So Chris Laidlock captures the catch-22. Okay? On the one hand, it's a critique of selling your soul for a few pieces of silver to Rupert Murdoch and Adidas, but the harsh reality was, what's the alternative? Okay? You needed the money to keep the players, otherwise they would be going to France, the UK, uh, Japan, and elsewhere. Okay, the same problem that South Africa faces uh, today and other teams. Okay, a second ad that came out and one that was much more global in nature uh, because they were trying to grasp onto something that was exotic and well known uh, within certain quarters of at least the rugby fraternity sorority. Okay, was an, is officially called black but it was, uh, uh, it drew upon the haka. Okay, it, garnered a lot of controversy for a wide range of reasons. So uh, for those of you who have seen it, um, I'll just show it. I remember a friend of mine who was a sports journalist from Finland calling me up and saying, what the hell was that? Okay, there were a couple of reasons why this, why this ad was controversial, but the first thing I'll highlight is one of the uh, media explanations that was offered about why Adidas invested so much money. And I think it's, it's common sense, but this is why they highlighted the Haka was so important to the advertising marketing campaign. You have to go back to why did Adidas come in and pay all that money for the All Blacks. It's because the All Blacks can deliver something to their brand that no other team or individual can in sport, which is they are playing a very, very physical game it has been called the last warrior sport in the world. Not only that, but they play it with intensity and the easiest way to judge that intensity is through the haka. That is exactly what Adidas wanted in terms of what the All Blacks could bring to their brand. It introduced a gutsier, more primal element as well as the sheer artistry of rugby. Okay? From the producer, Howard Grieve, who worked for Saatchi & Saatchi, a global advertising firm, the concept was always centered around the haka and a primal sound design. We always wanted to create a sort of primal, scary ad. You can judge for yourself. I think most of you would have seen enough hakas that it's not as intimidating as it once might have been. Okay, again, Howard Grieve from Saatchi Advertising Agency. One of the key words that Adidas were keen to go with was authenticity. So that's why we shot a game and that's why we shot the haka. We knew that if we could just show people what it is actually like to be confronted by the haka, and to watch the All Blacks play their game, then you don't have to manufacture anything. All you have to do is show it, okay? It is authentic in one hand, but if I told you that they brought over at least 50 professional cameramen 
who worked for NFL, National Football League uh, film, documentary filmmaking, okay? I think you might see that it's less authentic. It wasn't as if they had one camera and shot it. It was completely manufactured. Not only that, they had each and every All Black go into a sound studio and record a haka individually and then layered it, layer upon layer upon layer in order to get that sound. So yes, it's authentic, it was those players, but there was a lot of technology used uh, to bring it into place. Why was this controversial? Well, on the one hand, it's about Maori stereotyping, the use, the articulation of the historical nature of the warriors, the Maori warrior of the past, as an aggressive, violent being, okay? Articulated with the rugby players of today, many of whom are Maori, or at least Pacific Island. Okay, but it was also challenged okay, and critiqued because of the exploitation, okay, the commercial exploitation of indigenous Maori culture. So not surprisingly, a lawsuit was filed okay, um, not long after, about one year after this, this ad was released. And here's, it was for 1.5 million, which doesn't seem like a lot of money. Maui Solomon, the lawyer, had the following to say. You've got major corporates who are drawing upon Maori branding Maori imagery and Maori icons to promote their products. Now, if you're going to do that, then they've got to uh, go to Maori and make sure they have the proper authority. And if there's going to be a commercial return, then what share of those benefits will Maori get? Okay. And this is an ongoing thing where people go, which parts of New Zealand slash indigenous culture are things that should be paid for and made commercially viable? Okay. And it's not an easy, uh, not an easy thing to address. Why was a lawsuit filed? Well, it was claimed by the Ngati Toa tribe, whose ancestor chief Te Roparaha, that he was the one who invented it. Okay? Therefore, they said since he was the author, the original author, back in the 1820s, they deserve some financial compensation for the use of that ad. Okay? The first known ad, the first known event that we know of in terms of the haka being used in sport, because hakas are used for many other things. They're used at funerals, at births, to honor guests who are coming or going, at graduations and many other things. But the first use in sport that we know of was in 18, uh, 1888 as part of the New Zealand Native Football Representatives Tour of Britain and Australia. Okay? And this claim uh, back to Te Roparaha from the Ngati Toa tribe has had a long, uh, enduring history up till 2014. And I'll explain that in a second. How did the New Zealand Rugby Union respond when they were facing a lawsuit? They simply said, we don't want the haka to be for sale, and if it were, we wouldn't be a willing buyer of it. I don't think anyone thinks the haka is performed for commercial purposes. If it was ever reduced to that, then I'm reasonably sure we wouldn't want to perform it. If the haka is for sale, what isn't? The haka is very special to New Zealand rugby, and it has a very special place. It's a part of our game. We've defended the right to do it against attack from time to time. We've never had to pay for the privilege. To do so would demean the mana or the power prestige okay, of it for all of us. Okay? Interestingly, uh, in 2011, the New Zealand Rugby Union signed a deal with the tribe Ngati Toa, acknowledging that Te Roparaha was the author, but there was no financial payment. So what they're acknowledging is that Ngati Toa now has the right and the government has supported it to sue or to seek compensation financially from foreign companies who use the haka for commercial gain. Again, something that's still quite controversial. How has the haka been exploited? Well, all you have to do is a YouTube clip and you'll find everything from gingerbread bread men doing, uh, doing a haka to uh, women uh, on a beach on a tropical island for Bass Breweries UK, uh, for Fiat Motor Company, uh, and uh, we have a, a, a job uh, center uh, in, the, in Scotland. We have people going down the main street. In France, we have a gambling uh, unit uh, performing a haka, and the most recent one that just came out last week was the national government of France using the Kappa Opango, not the Kamate haka, okay, as part of a fitness regime for elderly people. Okay. This has already been taken to task by, uh, by some people in New Zealand. Some people find it offensive, some people find it quite cute. And I, I certainly don't have time to show you all these, but just to highlight how the haka is and has been appropriated for commercial gain. There are other complaints about the use of the haka. The use of it in terms of is it 
in the spirit of sportsmanship and fair play? Does it promote a violent culture? Well, some of you may remember in 2005, the launch, it was actually the Springboks playing at Carisbrook Stadium in Dunedin at a new haka, Kappa O Pango, okay, that describes what it, what it means to be in the black jersey. It's about being in the moment as an all-black player and what you will do for your team. Okay, and here you see Tama, Tana Umanga um, performing it, and you'll recall the controversial ending where the tongue came out and slashed the throat, which a lot of people in New Zealand did not like. The composer of this, Derek Lardelli, said the following, describing it. A throat-cutting gesture at the end of a fierce new all-black haka symbolizes the cutting edge of sport and not the slaughter of opponents. The players are on the knife edge. They are gladiators in the arena. If they win, they are heroes. If they lose, they are taken apart. I wouldn't argue with any of that, but I don't believe that you can walk around anywhere and make that motion and say that it's all in the spirit of sport. And my inside sources tell me that he was forced to make up something quite quick because he never anticipated that there would be a backlash against this particular haka. Okay, and here's one. And this is from uh, a long-serving member of a very small rugby club in New Zealand. There's only one interpretation of a coat uh, slitting gesture, and that is a threat to kill. Can we all walk up to someone and run our thumb across our throat? Because in Roman days, that meant stick the sword to their throat. Okay. So, taking on the whole idea of a violent episode. Okay, and again, the politics of the haka, whether it be through uh, commercial exploitation, the, uh, repro the reproduction of Maori stereotypes, whether it's in the spirit of fair play, but there's another aspect of the kamate haka, the one composed by Te Roparaha, that very few people know and very few people talk about. And that is that Te Roparaha actually murdered many members of the Nai Naitahu tribe, which is the tribe that's located around where, I, where we live in the South Island. It is one of the most untold stories and something we're just starting to research, and it's not easy to get people to talk about it. Okay. We only know that it exists in part because when visiting tribes come to Dunedin and they go to the marae or the meeting house, they are not allowed to perform the Kamate Haka. And yet I've never seen a protest at an all-black uh, test match against any other team. So it's not as if they're that vocal about it, but it, it is clearly very offensive to them. So that's one of the projects that we're starting to look at now. So when other, team, other countries get upset about the haka, just know that there are people within New Zealand, Maori people within New Zealand, that don't support it either. Okay? Why did the Kapa Opengo haka came, come along? I think some of the players drove it in part because they wanted something new. The Kamate was becoming stale. There were concerns about trademarking and copyright and whether the All Blacks would have to pay for it. Okay? That's another thing that's not talked about, but it was clearly part of the equation. Okay, another con more contemporary example, and this is just a snapshot. In 2007, the All Blacks released a, a new campaign called Bonded by Blood. Okay, a very simple poster that if you uh, bought an All Blacks jersey in a sports store, you got a copy of this poster. Why was it so significant? Because it was the first time anything like this had ever been done. Adidas took the blood of every All Black on the team, mixed it, and embedded that blood, in effect embedded the DNA of that All Black rugby team into a poster. Now, 30 years ago, you might have called that clever. In the age of cloning and Jurassic Park, this takes on a whole new meaning in terms of what people are able to extract. Could we be talking about the boys from Brazil? Or the boys from New Zealand? Okay. Another project in the background that we're looking at. But it says something about the use of technology and the implications of how far advertising and marketing will go. In October 2012, okay, a year after the Rugby World Cup in New Zealand, New Zealand got a new sponsorship, AIG Insurance, okay, an American insurance company. A contract that runs till 2018 at estimated at $20 million a year. And again, I've tried to do the conversion. And here you see the CEO, Peter Hancock, 
uh, with the CEO of uh, Steve Chu from the New Zealand Rugby Union. One of the big changes that occurred with this sponsorship was one, AIG, for the first time in New Zealand history, got front and center on the playing jersey. They used to allow sponsors on the training jerseys, but never on the front of the jersey. And it's about, the, they were the last team in the world, I think, pro team to hold out for that. But it was also a complete rebranding. It wasn't just the All Blacks, the All Blacks name was now extended to the Maori All Blacks, the All Blacks Sevens team, the Black Ferns, the Women's Sevens, the Under 20 National Team. AIG Insurance, 29th largest public company in the world. And can anybody guess why this company from the US decided to pick a rugby team in New Zealand to sponsor? Okay, we can't say with 100% with certainty, but all of this was done once everything was signed, sealed, delivered for Rugby Sevens to be in the 2016 Olympics. Okay, that decision was made about 2009, so a little bit earlier, but for everything to get lined up in terms of sponsorships, okay, I think that was one of the driving forces. Okay, access to an even bigger global audience with a team that might have a shot at a, at a medal, but who knows these days because Sevens is pretty close. The big concern here is that AIG Insurance, again a huge company, in 2008 went broke like many of the investment companies in, and insurance companies in the United States and were in fact bailed out okay, by the US government, that is by the US taxpayer. Okay? Some of the poorest taxpayers who may have lost their life savings to this, some would describe as corrupt company. Okay? So I think there's a, lot, there's a big ethical dilemma here in terms of AIG. Why did the New Zealand Rugby Union take the money? Well, it's pretty easy. Steve Chu, the CEO, says, we are in a challenging time in this world we live in. We have a business that has roughly $100 million turnover a year. It needs to be significantly more than that if we're going to survive. If we're going to grow the game at the community level, and if we're going to retain players. Okay? It's a challenge for us, and we need some money. Very explicit, to the point. What, what did AIG hope to get out of this? They hope to get a global icon, something that was on global television increasingly with events like the Rugby Championship, the Super 15, okay, the Rugby World Cup, and as I mentioned, the fact that Sevens Rugby was going to be in the 2016 Olympics. If you go to the AIG website, just like Adidas used the jersey thing to embed themselves in New Zealand rugby history, so has AIG created a timeline where they show their company okay, walking hand in hand basically with the All Blacks going back to 1919. Well, as we know, AIG Insurance only hooked up with the All Blacks in 2012, and yet they're able to claim okay, that cultural okay, currency, corporate nationalism, that corporate currency. Okay. And here's one, uh, it's basically not an advertisement that you'd see every day, but it's the one on their website, and it's shown from time to time at, during test matches to really highlight the close connections of the values between these two companies. Thank you. 
So what does AIG get? It gets a whole network of new promotional opportunities to expand their brand. It allows them to align their values with the most successful uh, sporting team in world history, as they put it. Okay? And it allows them to escape okay, some of the corruption scandals that they had back in 2008. Okay? To be associated with a winning and generally perceived as a fair play team. I'm not sure if that's true on every, uh, every game at the Ruck uh, uh, during a Springbok test, but in a general sense, I think there's a, a sense of fair play there. So what are the consequences? That's one team okay, in one sport, the All Blacks. What about the Springboks? So here are some of their sponsors, and you'll know more about this than I. How have they used the Springboks and South African rugby history and tradition in their advertising and marketing campaigns? Have they engaged in this process of corporate nationalism? That is to draw upon the icons, the symbols, the memories, okay, and stereotypes that tug at our heartstrings as citizens. Okay. Is it okay? Is there anything that crosses the line? And if so, how do we judge what that line might be? Okay, the Springboks have a new uh, major sponsor, as I understand it. It's no longer Canterbury, it is Essex. And here's what the CEO of Essex, uh, Europe, uh, Middle East, and Africa said. Essex has a long and proud tradition of partnering with athletes, teams, and federations. And we are extremely proud and excited about expanding our cutting edge performance products into the rugby market, and in particular, working alongside one of the leading partners in that market, the South African Rugby Union. With South Africa providing huge growth potential, ASIC's partnership um, uh, with, SA, with SARU is a chance for us to continue to build our brand awareness and positioning in the South African market, whilst also supporting the Springboks in their quest to become the number one rugby side in the world. Going further, he says, ASIC has made a strategic decision to make the sport of rugby a priority. The Springboks are one of the most important assets in the sporting goods world. We want to build the brand awareness together. Okay. The Springboks are an asset to this global company, okay. which is out there searching okay, for important, powerful, cultural okay, symbols and forces that also have an economic value. The one positive thing, if I understand the negotiations, they are trying to ensure that some of the production of ASEC, ASEC's products is done here in South Africa. And I think that's a very proactive stance to take. I'm not sure if that's been signed off or not, but I hope that that does come, uh, come as part of the uh, negotiations. Okay, I'll jump into a conclusion here by draw, drawing upon the work of a Marxist geo social geographer, David Harvey, who has this concept of monopoly rent. And see if this applies to the All Blacks and the Springboks as global assets. 
The struggle to accumulate marks of distinction and coll collective symbolic capital in a highly competitive world is on. But this entrains in its wake all of the localized questions about whose collective memory, whose aesthetics, and whose benefits. What we have in today's world, and it's beyond rugby, okay, we can look at any realm of society and beyond that, any realm of popular culture indeed, okay, are global corporations that are seeking globally or potentially global vehicles for the promotion of their corporate brands okay, as they merge okay, with other corporations to gain additional power that might have the potential to transform us from a sense of citizenship into consumers. Thank you.